And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our conversation today. Today, we will be getting into services and strategies to protect your portfolio. Of course, as always, a big thank you to Suzanne and Robert from REI Inc., who have been sponsoring these calls over the past month or so. We've really had some outstanding information disseminated to the investor community across the nation, and today is no exception. We have an outstanding panel today with experts from across the United States who are really going to dive into the services and strategies on how they are seeing the investment community navigate the new reality. Without further ado, I'm going to get right into some introductions here. And we're going to start off with James Barrett, Business Development Manager from Tenant Turner. Welcome, ago welcome aboard, James. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, James, James Barrett from Richmond, Virginia, one of the co-founders of Tenant Turner, um, also responsible for business development. And what we do at Tenant Turner is help uh, residential property managers and investors automate their leasing process, reduce their vacancy. Um, and we've seen you know, quite a shift over the past couple of months uh, in, in relation to that leasing activity and excited to share our insights with the group. Oh, thanks so much, James. And next up, we have Jeff Klein, for Executive Dis Director of SVN out of sunny Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Jeff. Good afternoon, Jeff. How are you doing? Thank you and Suzanne so much for uh, the invitation to join in today. I and we really appreciate it. Uh, SVN, SFR of Advisors, is a commercial brokerage that represents buyers and sellers uh, dedicated totally to this space, to the SFR investment space in the portfolio um, segment, essentially. We also operate um, one of the top uh, research data and valuation companies in the country as well. So thank you very much. Really glad to be part of today's program. Oh, thanks so much, Jeff. Next up, we have Greg Rand, Chief Strategy Officer with Renner's Warehouse. How are we, Greg? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate being invited. Um, Renters Warehouse is a third-party property manager, um, 22,000 doors across 40 markets for single-family rentals. They acquired my company last January. That company was called Own America, which was an online platform for buyers and sellers of SFR portfolios. So now, by combining those two things, um, our mission is to be you know, a leading national brand uh, nationwide for SFR investing for both mom and pop small investors that use this as a retirement fund all the way to institutional players who as I'm sure everybody here will validate are, are really lining up um, aggressively to come into our space so it's a good time to be alive in the SFR business. I couldn't agree with you more Greg thanks so much. Next up we have Darren Bloomquist VP of Market Economics with Auction.com Darren, love to have you aboard. You are the man with the data. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, uh, I love I love data. I heart data, and it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. We have a lot of internal data at auction.com. We're, we're selling, last year we sold um, on our platform about 50 to, between 50 and 60,000 properties, uh, foreclosure auctions and bank-owned REO properties via online auction. So have that data as well as I look at a lot of the public record data and see what's going on and uh, happy to share what we're seeing with our buyer behavior in particularly folks who are primarily looking at SFR investing on our platform. Uh, thank you very much, Darren. Always great to have you on the panels. And then finally, Rosario Tarasano. Welcome. Click Invest, uh, formerly out of Chicago, Illinois. Now I hear you're in Florida. Tell me a little bit about yourself and your company, Rosario. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you guys very much for uh, have us, having us on. It's definitely a blessing to, to be on this call. So uh, we are an end-to-end -end platform for the mom and pop investor that's looking for flip opportunities or uh, that's building a long-term long -term rental portfolio. So uh, between my partner, Jeffrey Kirshner, and I, we've been on the buy or the sales side of over 7,000 uh, single-family homes over the last several years. And uh, we cut our teeth on uh, servicing imitation homes uh, when they were buying throughout the Midwest. 
So thank you for uh, having us on this call. Well, thank you so much, Rosario. And finally, my name is Jeffrey Tesh. I am CEO of RCN Capital. We are a nationwide platform for single family investors across the United States. We started our company back in 2010 uh, out of the previous crisis, really focusing on developing best practices and really working with investors to be able to provide transparent, on-time financing for not only their short-term bridge needs, whether it be fix and flip or fix and hold, but longer-term, 30-year portfolios, single asset, as well as portfolio across the United States. Really proud to be here today. One more time, thank you so much to REI Inc. for putting together just an outstanding panel today uh, that I have the privilege of moderating. So let's get right into that. You know, we are dealing with a new reality today and certainly services and strategies protecting that rental portfolio is going to be our topic. But my guess is we're going to dive into a whole bunch of not only data, but best practices. And Darren, you know, I'm going to start off with you as an old friend and you've provided certainly my company with data points over the year and you've been able to share what's happening in the good times and bad. And I would love you to just start off, Darren, with an overview on, on what you're seeing at auction.com and how it pertains to uh, what I expect is a very large audience of investors on our call today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Jeff. And yeah, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, I think that one of the headlines out of this is that may surprise people is in the distress market, which is what we focus on and where a lot of investors are going there to find their deals, is we actually see in the short term low supply because of all the foreclosure moratoriums, but very quickly rebounding demand. We saw a drop off in demand that some of the metrics that we look at on our platform, and I can get into those, but in, I, I look at, I'm looking at data by week now as opposed to by month because of the way things are moving now. And so if I, I look at week 13 as a, as a turning point in 2020, uh, week 13 is the week of uh, March 22nd to March 28th. We, we kind of bottomed out in terms of demand on our platform in terms of bidders coming in and, and buying and, and primarily look, looking at the online uh, activity as opposed to we also do in-person foreclosure auctions, but the in-person foreclosure auctions the week before had pretty much dried up instantly thanks to the foreclosure moratoriums. And we also saw people, investors were shocked. Um, they they were pulling back on the online auctions instantly that that week, week 13 of, of uh, 2020 between the 22nd and 20, uh, 28th of the year of, of March. But we have seen that quickly rebound and, and demand has picked up very quickly. Um, so that's, that's one headline out of this that, that we're seeing with our data. And I think it's interesting that that's reflected, I think, in a lot of the retail market data that I look at as well. When I look at the multiple listing service data, and I'm also looking at that by week now as opposed to by month. And similar, a, a, a sharp drop off in supply as sellers were scared of the market and pulled their listings or didn't list their properties. But uh, prices and sales dropped off as a result, but, but average prices, for the most part, until maybe the, the most recent week, and we could talk about that later, have continued to go up in the retail market. And we're seeing you know, somewhat similar trends in, uh, in the distressed market. Investors have quickly, I think, found their, their sea legs and regained their confidence is how I would interpret the data that we're seeing. Uh, and a very quick turnaround uh, by the sounds of it. What you're seeing internally at auction.com, are you seeing distressed predominantly or are you beginning to see uh, more ad advantageous listings of folks just trying to get properties out there at, let's say, more retail rates? Yeah, that is a great question. And, you know, our focus has been distressed. So that's primarily our our sweet spot, but we have been just me personally, and I know other folks in the company have been fielding some questions. We've done this in the past, but not a lot, but we've been fielding more questions from folks who 
who do want to sell more of a retail single family rental turnkey type of product on our platform just in the last few weeks. So that's something that has been coming in. And uh, I, I think that's, and it's mostly, you know, it's not individual homeowners so much, although I've gotten a couple <laughs> from brokers uh, interested in that kind of angle on things. But the, the in inquiries are from investors who maybe have some of that turn key product or portfolios and are looking to sell on our platform. Um, and so that, uh, I think, is, is an interesting development. I'm not sure what to make of it at this point, but um, that's something that uh, we've seen more interest in just in the last few weeks. Interesting, interesting. And Jeff, I, I'm going to throw it over to you. Um, as a platform, as a brokerage, uh, certainly Darren has seen things at auction.com. What are you seeing from an inventory level? Are you seeing price adjustments? If you could give us an overview of uh, the past couple of months and how it's affected uh, your brokerage. Sure, Jeff. Uh, I tell you, since March 13th of this year, it's been super interesting and amazingly fascinating <laughs> is the best way I can describe it. There's been many things happening, kind of transitioning and shifting uh, literally uh, on a weekly basis, as Darren just mentioned, it used to be a monthly um, review in, in, re in regards to stats and, and data, but it's really down to daily and certainly weekly in today's market area. At our On our digital platform, sfrhub.com, we literally within about one week to two weeks of uh, March 13th, I kind of see as day one, happened to be in New York City in meetings that particular day. That was the second day that offices were starting to close down in New York City. So that's kind of what I perceive as kind of day one, in my mind at least. It was just barely shortly after, and that's why it's been how things have shifted so quickly. But immediately within a two to three week period of time, our inventory onboarding velocity was up by 650% which included both existing asset um, SFR portfolios, as well as the BFRs, the built for rents. And then a couple of weeks later, as we look back in the rear view mirror with four or five weeks behind us, we quickly uh, figured out that we had literally onboarded about 15,000 built for rent homes. So there's been a big shift in both existing asset with mom and pops, uh, seeing some of the both near-term and potentially longer-term challenges um, during and post-COVID-19 as far as marketing their existing asset portfolios that maybe they've owned for years or decades for that matter. And then there was a huge shift uh, with our builder clientele uh, for balance sheet adjustment just for only a couple of weeks. So it was very short-lived. It was very interesting where there was some discounting and some good opportunity. But then that quickly really dried up and things came back really over the course of the last couple of weeks to what I call would be pretty stable and, and normal uh, valuations and acquisition opportunities. But um, during that two or three week period of time, uh, we saw uh, several capital groups really um, move in or run in and understand the opportunity and get deals uh, under agreement. So it's been very interesting. Uh, on the built rent side, it's been interesting as I've been out to subdivisions that are under construction, purpose built for built for rent. Um, it's been interesting because literally the uh, home building or construction industry uh, hasn't seemed to see either labor or material impact uh, as a result of COVID. And uh, as we all know, the retail market on home sales did soften, but seems to be, be uh, coming back not, un not unlike rent collections in the rental industry. So the long and the short, um, I believe at this point, and it's probably too early to tell, uh, we aren't out of COVID-19 by any means of imagination, but we've all learned a lot. But there just seems like uh, the buyers have not found uh, the bloodbath that they anticipated Yep. in that third and fourth week in March. Yeah, and I think that's really well said, Jeff. Um, what do you attribute to the large number of listings that you saw, and are they still there uh, since the sort of the beginning of the crisis? 
Great question. Uh, there's just been a huge amount of buyer uh, activity and velocity that's occurred really just in the last two to three weeks. Uh, there was uh, starting that second or third week in March, there was certainly a, a good month of buyer pause. Uh, certainly, as we're all aware, still a bit of a pause in the SFR uh, industry in regards to acquisitions on with some of the REITs or larger scale private capital groups. But in the commercial real estate side, which is typically our buyer uh, for our um, assets or our inventory, uh, we've just we've seen them come to the table. There was a pause, but they've really swooped in, um, basically just to offset what they feel may be or the perception is operating and/or valuation losses in other commercial asset class. You know, hospitality, office, we know is going to be a completely different asset segment from this point forward, and certainly retail. So, I've been a lot of vision uh, come into this space from other commercial real estate segments. No, that's really well said. And, you know, Greg, um, I, I want to bring you in on this as, as somebody who really soup to nuts has the solution for renters across the country, uh, a bit of a one-stop shop. What are you seeing as to what Dar Darren and Jeff have mentioned, which is, you know, various levels of supply, demand ticking down and then coming back up? How How has your platform been affected, Greg? Uh, well, it is interesting how the commercial industry recognized very quickly, but both commercial and just entities that manage capital across different asset classes um, and how there is a flight to quality and stability right now and residential single family in particular is really shining. Like It's an amazing thing. You sit here, like literally the whole country was told you need to go to this particular place if you want to live, right? And that place is home, <laughs> you know? Like, you can't go to the office too dangerous, can't go shopping too dangerous, you need to go here. I think that realization that, you know, we're all focused on what's essential now, what businesses are essential, what roles in the world need to be played, what's essential. And everybody knew that a place to live would be essential. Um, but now we're actually seeing mobility regarding your place to live. Like, our rent collection, we didn't know going into April whether or not 60% of the customers would pay the rent and the rest of them would buy into this idea that landlords are evil and you don't have to pay your rent, right? You just didn't know. That's the the hallmark of this whole experience is all these chess games you have to play to figure out if this, then maybe that. Um, we collected 95% of the rents in April and we collected 60% on May 1st for May's rents. And it, it bespeaks of this idea that when I need to make sure that my housing situation is stable, the first thing I do is pay the rent. Uh, which was exciting to see happen. Uh, and we're seeing a lot, we're back up to normal activity with respect to tenant activity. So it starts to kind of paint the picture that when people need to move or want to move, they, they, they consider that to be an essential service also. So we expected about a third of our movement activity, the bit part of our business that relates to people changing homes, uh, tenants that is, and it came back. Uh, May's numbers are going to be really close to what our objective was before we ever heard of COVID-19 for the month of May. So um, and then you, you turn the corner on the commercial real estate where, and the, and the asset managers across multiple asset classes who are looking at their portfolios, and some of them are really having sec segments of their portfolios that are in big trouble, and they need to find places where they can move capital, where they can offset that, like Jeff said. And so we're seeing people showing up that have massive global portfolios of hospitality that are now showing up and saying, we need to, we need to get SFR. Same thing with office, same thing with retail. So um, it's day to day, week to week to figure out what the next pivot's going to be. But the compacted nature of this recession, how it all happened over a matter of weeks instead of months or even a year or more, it's starting to feel like the recovery could have a compacted time frame also. Uh, that's well said, Great. and you know, um, I, I just want to follow up with that because certainly as a lender, you know, RCN, we're a nationwide lender, and we've seen such an incredible demand for the single-family rental product. Now, 2019, it was approximately 50% of our origination, half being bridge, half being uh, longer-term rental, and just in the past six weeks. Um, the uptick in long-term rental demand 
uh, whether it be smaller operators or larger portfolios, is just tremendous. I, I want to ask you the question, will the availability of product hold up for the demand that, that you know, we're starting to see? Of rentals in particular? Like exactly. Like rent to tenants? Exactly. Good question. You know, I mean, when you see, uh, probably not, right? So there's going to be uh, a dinner bell of people acquiring and converting uh, properties into rental. I'll give you an example. Renters Warehouse, when it was launched 11 years ago, was in the, in the middle of a housing crisis, and their opening marketing campaign was, don't sell your house. It's a bad time to sell your house. Keep it, turn it into a cash machine, and live to fight another day. And that we're seeing owners that wanted to sell their properties this spring who are saying, um, you know, I don't want to take a beating. I'm not motivated to sell this property right now. I need to move, but I'm going to turn it into a rental. Um, we're seeing Airbnbs become long-term rentals. We're seeing, obviously, acquirers getting ramped up. We're, we don't see the big rush of acquisition capital flowing yet because our clients are kind of lining it all up at the starting line, waiting till somebody breaks, <laughs> you know, into the, into the race again. Um, but I think the that this idea of a comp everything is compacted right now. So the, the migration out of New York, for example, down to Florida and the Carolinas, which has been happening for decades, which is going to continue in perpetuity, it almost feels like 10 years worth of migration is going to happen in one year. The migration out of New York City into the suburbs of New York City. People living in Manhattan who were kind of going to make their way out to the burbs as they got a little older, older, you know, had kids or, or the kids got older and they started worrying about schools. That that 10 years worth of that migration feels like it's going to happen in 18 months. Um, and so, yeah, I think demand and supply is going to be fascinating to watch in the near term because you're going to literally see heat mapping expansion of demand in places where there's nowhere near enough supply. And then the, the, the game is going to be how do you create that supply and, and capitalize on it? No question about it. And uh, we are going to get to the build to rent discussion today as well. But before we do that, you know, Rosario, you know, you have a pretty sophisticated uh, online platform there at Click Invest. I just want to get a handle on what you're seeing in this new COVID environment. Uh, upticks, uh, just sort of uh, discuss a little bit about what you're seeing today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, from a data perspective, we, we pretty much saw what everybody else saw. Right in the first few weeks, uh, one of the mantras here was data over emotions. So we weren't going to allow the emotions and, and the stress and the paranoia to drive us. Um, so we got in the ear of of our client base and said, "Hey, look, follow our lead. We're going to dive into the data and we're going to take this day by day, week by week." And what we saw right away was was a squeeze on inventory. Right, um, inventory started to to tighten up. Uh, contract activity went right off the cliff. New listings went right off the cliff. And within a few weeks, though, we started to see that pop in contract activity, so much so that Central Florida and the markets that we cover is completely rebounded. Uh, we even broke, we broke through last year's trend line uh, as far as contract activity. Uh, Illinois, the Chicago land market is pretty much right back in line to where it was. But you brought up the, the inventory issue. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, well, actually, six weeks ago, right when all this started uh, started to to unravel, there were a ton of opportunities, and we had those brave souls. So, so I'll explain who we work with. Right, we work with the mom and pop that does a couple deals a year, all the way up to uh, the operator that does sixty to a hundred deals a year. Um, so, not in the institutional space by any means. These are these are local mom and pop that are that are. Uh, boots on the ground doing this for themselves. So the guys that have been doing this for a long time, they saw the opportunity and they went right for it. And they got some good deals over a two to three, four week period. Everybody else that sat back and was watching all the social media gurus talking about, now's the best time to buy or they're, you know, blood in the streets. It's like, shut it off. I mean, those guys, they're not paying attention to data. They, they don't understand supply and demand and where the inventory levels were. So now, as we fast forward, we have a lot of clients that that see that they missed that short-term opportunity, right? Because inventory continues to get squeezed. We're in multiple offer situations on every deal that we go after for our clients. Um, and our messaging to our client base is, hey, in the next three to six months, we feel it's a great opportunity to, to flip 
what we like to say that the lower end of the market, we like to stay under 250,000 for our acquisitions and dispositions. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity there to rehab a property, get it on the market and get it sold quickly because there's just nothing there. So the next three to six months, we feel are very opportune for, for flippers, um, for guys that are buying for long-term rental. It, our guys like to buy deeper, right? They're looking for, for stronger yields than a lot of the more passive investors. Um, it's a tough time to buy for them, right? But we, basing on what's happening in the economy and all the indicators where everything's pointing, we think Q1 in the Q2 of next year, there's going to be, I don't want to say a tsunami and all this, because nobody knows what, what all these stimulus packages are really going to do. Um, but we feel Q1 of next year, we're going to see quite a loosening when it comes to, to inventory. So. Well, I appreciate that. And that, that certainly makes sense. And, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, I want to quick go back to Darren. Darren, price point. Um, you know, uh, Rosario mentioned that where the sweet spot is right now, you see a ton of data on auction.com. Are you seeing variations in price point right now uh, from from your online listings? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of comments Rosario made that I, I think uh, I'd love to address. The And the price point piece, I think, Rosario, you said, uh, what was your target there for your folks? Um, we like to stay under 250000 Okay. Yeah, and I mean, again, we're we're focused on the distress market, so it's it's a little different. But um, you know, we're seeing on these online auctions that we're 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 selling the the average price at the end of April, the last week of April, um, ending actually ending on May second, was the average winning bid was one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars for a property sold on our on our platform, and that has um, pretty consistently been. It's not quite as stable as the retail market, but it's consistently been increasing from a year ago. That that's one of those demand factors that we look at that shows us that that is continuing to go up. Um, what uh, what is interesting, actually, I think Jeff said this earlier uh, that we saw as well, and and I think Rosario addressed it as well. Is that there was this kind of this very short window of opportunity for buyers. Uh, now I think there'll be opportunity going forward. But buyers who are willing to brave the uncertainty right after the shock of the, the pandemic declaration and the national emergency and all, all the stay at home stuff, we did see our sellers uh, capitulating just a little bit on price. We look at the average sales price to the seller reserve, where an auction environment, the seller sets, okay, here's what we want to get. We won't take anything under this, um, theoretically. And that's typically around that ratio is around 100% because the sellers say, yeah, we want to get X amount for this property. And once it hits that, we'll take that. Um, but in the week of, uh, in the very early April, in the week of uh, April 12th, we saw that drop to 96%, which is the lowest we've seen all year. So in other words, sellers were saying, oh, you know what? We'll, we'll accept bids that are actually a little bit under reserve, uh, 96% of reserve. But now that's popped right back up in the in the most recent week, which is the week ending the 9th of, of, May, of uh, May that I have data for, that's popped back up to 103%. So there was kind of that short window of opportunity for uh, the short-term buyers, but uh, or for the buyers who were able to, willing to jump in there right in the, in the midst of the uncertainty, but that has quickly, closed i mean that's not saying that there's not still opportunity because when you look at the demand uh, side of rentals as, as greg was addressing um yeah, there's there's still a lot of that and, and one more thing uh, before i i stop my ramble um i think i mean we're seeing the opposite of what rosario uh, said at least in the sentiment we did a buyer survey and about most of our buyers are actually flippers which probably makes sense they're taking distressed properties and reselling rehabbing them reselling them and about 60 percent are are doing that but there's 33 percent who are buying and holding according to the survey and what we found is those buy and hold investors who are these are single family properties that we're selling residential um 
they are more they were more confident and this was a survey we did in april after the 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 crisis hit and 64 percent of those buyers on our platform were saying we actually want to increase or at least keep the same if not increase our acquisitions going forward this year whereas the home flippers or people who identified as rehab and resell that was it was actually under 50 percent that were saying that were they were planning to, to increase or keep acquisitions the same um going forward so i thought that was i don't know if that addresses your question exactly jeff but um those are some of the observations based on some of what the other panelists were saying just uh, just in the last few minutes no, I think I think you're 100 percent correct. And to what I said about what we're seeing, you know, as a lender at RCN Capital, like the phone is ringing. The phone is ringing as if, you know, no time has passed. So certainly some of those surveys that you did internally at auction.com, that data absolutely bears out what we're seeing um, on the front lines. Um, you know, most investors are using financing. And if the phone is ringing, Certainly, the acquisitions continue uh, both on flip and uh, and longer term rental. But just to sort of wrap up, you know, the state of what we're seeing, you know, James, uh, as somebody that's uh, you know got a really sophisticated leasing software, I'm wondering, you know, have you seen a significant rise or drop in tenant leads, showings, applications, you know, sort of all things leasing? What are you seeing today? Yeah, we we did see a, a pretty significant downtick um, in interest, kind of around that that same week thirteen period that that Darren had mentioned. It's it's kind of that that period where the world stopped turning, right? And tenant leads stopped uh, prioritizing finding their next property. Um, so we went through our our data to to see where things actually stood, um, and and. You know, March and April of this year, uh, we had more traffic on our site this year than last year. So I went back and looked at kind of year over year uh, traffic. And in January and February, uh, we had 55% year over year growth. In March, that dropped down to 16%. So you could just see an immediate downtick where there just were not many people looking to to make a move and i think a lot of it evolved around the uncertainty uh, of what was next um, we saw that also kind of continue into april as well where our year-over-year -year growth of traffic on our site was uh, at 17 percent um, but may uh, with based upon what we're seeing so far this month our projections is we're going to be back up to about 37 percent um, which is getting closer and closer back up to that 55% that we saw in January and February. So um, given this data, uh, what we see is that tenant, there was definitely a significant downtick in tenant leads who are interested, which obviously impacted showings, applications, and leases. Um, but we're already starting to see uh, folks come back to the other side of that valley. And as inventory hits the market, um, those prospective tenants are are coming out of the woodwork and they are uh, starting to get interested again in prioritizing uh, housing um, almost to the same level as before uh, the pandemic. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, I'm not surprised uh, and it certainly mirrors what our other panelists are saying today, which was there was that sharp downturn, but then Almost within a sh three or four weeks, we were seeing that rebound um, really across all asset classes, which is just fantastic news. Um, now, what I want to do is sort of you know switch gears here a little bit. You know, I want to provide real solutions to our audience today, the real estate investment community. Um, strategies not only on protecting their rental portfolio, but also growing it. And James, I'm gonna throw it back to you again. You know, um, has the leasing process changed? Maybe what are some best practices are to get these rentals up and running uh, in, in the new environment that we're in today? Absolutely, and, and, and the reality of it is, uh, if you wanna lease your properties, people have to be able to see them in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and traditionally that's been an in-person showing where the leasing agent is gonna meet a person or really groups of people uh, at a rental property. And, and you can think right out of the gates, the concept of an open house is, 
it, it's kind of dead right now. You know, that, and that was the primary tool uh, in the toolbox in order to get your, your properties uh, leased. You wanted to create some heat. You wanted to create some interest, some scarcity amongst those prospective tenants. They would see a bunch of other people there, quickly apply and move through. Um, but what we're seeing now is certainly an uptick in, in virtual showings and, and also self showings. Uh, so our platform can help with uh, self showings using electronic lock boxes. And before this uh, pandemic, we would see that about 29% of listings were using an electronic lock box where we vet the prospective tenant, allow them to get a unique code, and then they can go view the property on their own. Um, it was about, actually about March 20th is when we saw the shift from in-person showings being the majority of scheduling activity on Tenant Turner to self showings uh, using electronic lock boxes. Um, and we've seen that trend continued uh, e even to this point. So we have not really seen an uptick back in in-person showings, but people are just trying new technology. They're investigating new tools like Tenant Turner in order to continue to get their properties leased and not fall behind in their leasing process. I appreciate that. And, you know, Greg, I'm going to come back to you, uh, you know, certainly through your roots in Own America. And then, of course, now with Renner's Warehouse, your company has really has the solution from acquisition all the way from managing the property. And you're seeing on the front lines today what many of, of the customers uh sort of just dealing with and, and how they're figuring out how to run their businesses, whether it be the mom and pop investor or the more sophisticated investor. Greg, maybe some best practices on uh, how you're dealing uh, with your uh, large portfolio out there. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we have, you know, you, you go with the strengths that you have, right? One of the things that was very attractive for me with Renner's Warehouse and wanting to be here was the army of people on the ground. What I was learning in America was that I could only go so far from the cloud. It's a physical asset. Um, and so it's been great. The, the capabilities, one of the things that I've really learned through this, this um, last couple of months has been that the way that we've done things in the past has been the face-to-face the, the -face showing. It has had a salesperson involved um, and we do really well with the tenant screening and now we're seeing the benefit of that right so there's been some learnings about okay we have to figure out how to do this now somewhat remotely for as for i believe that that james is right we're going to see a percentage of people are not going to want to do it the old way ever again right so um but how do we re retain the benefit that we have because we have a human being involved that's kind of the challenge that we're wrapping our heads around that, that like we did a lot of accompanied showings where we didn't go inside, um, which is something we never did before. But we most of our houses were not on lock on on electronic lock boxes, and so the agents would go open the door, take a quick sweep through, turn the lights on, go out and hang out in the street, <laughs> and let the customer go through and see it on their own, but still be able to make eye contact and still be able to um, to put some of that. Um, oh, have, okay, have a nice day. I'm going to stick around because I've got more people coming to see the place in a little while, and that was true. So there's a balance there between the human intelligence and the human influence on these things and the technology, and we're trying to strike that where we don't lose any of what we were doing well before in this new kind of way of doing things. Yeah, that's super interesting. See, I, w I would think that there's, there is a benefit to having that in person, you know, socially distanced, of course, but available there to take the next step if that client is ready to take the next step. Um, maybe you could comment on that, on how the human interaction is still really important in the process of, of, of leasing out these homes. Yeah, I think um, I'm actually, we're experimenting with the electronic lockboxes and I'm being pulled back in the old school direction as I'm watching the way this plays out. I feel like the um, the thing I talked about a few minutes ago with, with the rents being paid on time and the um, the following up, people want to make an appointment to see a property, they inquire on it. Somebody who's motivated to make sure that person doesn't kind of drift off and go find something else, you know, giving them a call, sending them a text, trying to get that appointment scheduled, being there when the appointment's scheduled, even if you're not there in the room with them following up a little while later, creating urgency, as I mentioned, but also following up. It, what's, what's really interesting, we're seeing the conversion rate of showings to lease applications is way up. 
and it makes sense. Like, I don't want to see that many houses. Like, let me go, let me, let me look at 20 of them online and let me look at one of them in person. If I can pull that off as a tenant, then I've done this well, right? So I think there are folks who are like, I really wanted a covered back porch, but like, we'll take it, right? But people are settling a little bit for what they're, what they have available so that they can get it done. Housing stability, right, is, is really super important right now. Um, so all of that, there's a sales role here that I definitely believe plays a role in keeping these properties occupied with people that are going to pay the rent um, because you got a person who's motivated for commission to get that done. Yeah, it's amazing the way commission always works in good time and bad. That's that's well said. You know, Jeff, um, I, I, I want to transition to you for a minute because, you know, the phones are ringing. That's clear. Um, but I was wondering if you could provide some, you know, data, what's changed with the real estate transaction portion of your client's process in this new reality. And most importantly, how are investors winning um, in today's changed world? Yeah, great question, Jeff. <clears throat> One thing that we've started to see almost immediately is in the transaction uh, segment. And that's been interesting to everybody in the industry during COVID, you know, how many deals have dropped out, how many deals have, have went through. We've been fortunate in the majority of our deals have went through. There have been uh, a couple of dropout, obviously, as is the case with probably about every brokerage in the U.S. But it's been fascinating because with our online transactional platform that we build at sfrhub.com, literally the entire transaction takes place online essentially so we've seen um, this transition with the both the buyer and the client and the seller client base really starting to leverage that and get away from the old-fashioned systems including uh, different methods of inspection and different methods connecting to title companies with api instead of having a million emails back and forth so we've really seen a lot of growth and uh, really a lot of expansion and transition in the actual transaction element of the process, which has been really exciting. It's amazing the way technology, uh, it, it was there before, but it's so much more important today um, it is. It, as, we, as we move forward. It's, it's just tremendous. And, Go, go ahead, and Jeff. I think also, Jeff, I, I forgot one point, because, and I think this is pretty important. Um, we've, we've started to see the transition over the last few years as there's been new platforms come online, the, the Roof Stocks, the Own Americas, the SFR Hubs, so on and so forth. So it's interesting because it seems like the COVID-19 has truly been a major shift for some of the old-fashioned buyers and sellers of um SFR portfolios to really finally transition and accept digital online technology for this purpose, either to find the assets or to sell the assets. So I think it kind of triggered people that it might might have taken them another year or two years or three years, but all of a sudden they're just like, okay, this is so much easier. I can access thousands of homes right here online. So that that's been a big transition as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, folks, in general, I'm going to open up the question box as well. If any of our attendees on the uh, call today would like to put in some questions, we've already got a bunch uh, flowing in. Please go ahead and enter any questions and we'll try and leave some time at the end. Um, you know, I want to transition here to another topic that's really pre-COVID and certainly at many of the conferences that we all attend what was always a hot topic of discussion and that, and that was the i buyer um the zillows of the world coming in making offers doing minimal repairs uh versus the traditional investor that we all work with on a regular basis and most of the traditional investors that are on our call today um you know rosario i would love for you with your platform to comment, uh, you know, on how mom and pop compete with the i buyers, and will that going forward continue to be uh, a battle? Thank you, sir. So, from our side, um, this may surprise some folks, but a majority of what we do is still MLS driven. Um, we've built out a proprietary technology, and I mean, we've got algorithms and whatnot that that basically we 
we pull in data from multiple MLSs and we're able to filter quite extensively. And then it's a volume game. So for us, we've got to submit, just to give you an idea, um, in some cases, we've got to submit 100 offers to get anywhere from five to 10 offers accepted. So we're a high volume brokerage when it comes to the, the offer side of things. Um, most of our clients that do any off market um, direct mailing, you know, in, in regards to the markets that you're in, so we're in Illinois and Florida, they're not as affected, I think, as some of the different municipalities or the different target uh, areas like Arizona or Texas or whatnot. Um, the fact that these I buyers are settling for lower returns is certainly uh, an issue. Um, we have a lot of home investor clients, and those guys, from a marketing standpoint, tend to struggle with the I buyers. Um, but still, they're still having quite a bit of success. At the end of the day, it's a boots on the ground type game. Like Greg brought this up earlier. So, is there a market for the I buyer? Absolutely. The volume there, the numbers there, it's 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 pretty obvious. But a lot of our local investors, the boots on the ground guys, they're they're pounding the pavement daily. They're 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 sitting in living rooms. Certainly not as much uh, during COVID nineteen, but there's still uh, plenty of off market that they're dealing with. Yeah, see, it, we're we're finding it, that the same exact battle going on. Um, we do a ton of business with the home investors on the lending front, and they often um, have mentioned the I buyers as being problematic. But it's been very geographic specific across the nation. Um, and Jeff, since you're you're certainly a, a major force in Arizona. Um, what are you seeing on the on the eye buyer front? Is that something that you're seeing, and is it impacting the marketplace overall? A uh, great question. You know, we've seen uh, again, uh, not unlike everybody else has pretty much analyzed and mentioned in today's uh, conference, is that uh, the eye buyer certainly did take a pause uh, there for a few weeks or a month just to really determine what's going on. And as we're all aware now that. They're all back in the market. I, I think it's a really the, the I buyer concept is really kind of evolution of the industry, so to speak. Whereas we've seen another example would be in portfolio sales. I mean, literally, you know, seven, eight years ago, there was very few large scale portfolios that, that traded on the marketplace, certainly read to read or capital group to capital group, but not on the open marketplace. And then as that's evolved over the last few years, now investment portfolios in the SFR space is very common. Our average portfolio size right now today is about 84 homes. So pretty major investors. So the investor base has changed. And I think that's what's occurring really with the iBuyer uh, coming into the marketplace. It's a bigger buyer, well capitalized, uh, great knowledge and experience and background in the industry. And it's just evolving to that product type. So as we've all seen the last 10 to 12 to 15 years, the space has literally changed year to year as we go to annual conferences and see one another year after year after year. The amount of changes that have occurred in this industry has just been remarkable. I think the iBuyer, yeah, it is new competition uh, to some of the smaller investors and or mom and pops, but I think it's part of our industry evolution. I, I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how some of the lack of returns, most of these iBuyers are public companies, and most of the iBuyer platforms to this point have not uh, leveraged great returns. Um, Darren, are the iBuyers poking around your platform or how how are you seeing them interact? Yeah, that's an interesting question because we've we've had a we've like probably everybody else we've uh, definitely they've been on our radar we've been watching them, but they're not they're not purchasing um, from our platform and they're not purchasing in distressed properties at this point they hadn't been I mean not intentionally pursuing distressed properties I should say they certainly may be. Um, that's not their sweet spot. It's, it's more, it's properties that don't necessarily need a ton of work. And so we actually have asked the last couple of years in our surveys to buyers, you know, who do you consider your biggest competition? 
and iBuyers is one of the options on there, and it's it's uh, near the bottom in terms of of them considering them competition. I think it's it's you know similar to what you were saying about the home investors is that on the surface some of the marketing looks similar that the iBuyers are doing to homeowners directly to homeowners, but most of the folks buying off of our platform um, don't consider them competition, and the iBuyers themselves are not buying our properties, the properties that we have on our platform, I should say. Um, and, I, uh, you know, the majority of our buyers, at least right now, 76% are are uh, buying five or fewer homes a year. So I would consider those smaller investors or mom and pop. And um, and they were also very confident going forward about, uh, about the market. So, yeah, right now, um, and they, you know, they're... <laughs> They're looking for bigger returns than the i buyers are are making right now. They are actually ma- looking to profit off of the uh, the investment in a property as opposed to that being a se- seemingly a secondary uh, objective. If you look at what the i buyers are doing, it doesn't seem like profiting off the resale of the home is their their primary objective. Yeah, the, that goes without saying. Absolutely. The mom and pops continue to aggregate, but uh, we shall see how the eye buyers affect. And I think uh, this crisis is certainly going to play a role in that. But uh, as we get closer to the top of the hour, I, I don't want to leave built to rent off the table at all. And Greg, I'm going to throw it back to you. Um Certainly, you've seen the build to rent uh, industry evolve and how it's played out uh, with the various platforms. Greg, I'd I'd love to for you to just make some commentary on on what you're seeing in the build to rent um, as it pertains to your own company and the larger marketplace. Sure. Well, we're seeing that builders are the most motivated sellers right now. Um, you know, unlike an SFR portfolio owner who's cash flowing. Um, or an iBuyer who's, you know, not cash flowing. Um, but the the builder, you know, the, the life of a builder, if you think about a small builder and then it's extrapolated out to a larger one, they've got the subdivision they're in the middle of right now. There's 60 houses, there's 20 left. They want to get out of those 20 as soon as they can so they can move everybody over to the next subdivision they have on deck. They want to get a big bite out of that one if they can. This is under under normal circumstances. They're a machine that has current, has on deck, has land that's approved on deck behind that, and then it has raw land contracts on deck behind that. And if they don't keep moving, they can't keep their contractors going from job to job. Their their team will fizzle, their sales and marketing machine will fizzle. And so, you know, the amount of money they, they wanted to make on these houses in the spring of 2020 became irrelevant very quickly. And it was more about what can I sell these for so that I can continue to move on because if I get caught, it's like a, you know, the sales coming down or there's no wind, the sailboat's not going to move, but they can't keep the momentum. They can't keep their pipeline going. And so um, people that were not um, open to a bulk sale were all of a sudden open to a bulk sale and people that were locked on to their retail prices were no longer locked on to the retail prices because they needed a solution and somebody with capital that would buy and then buy also into the future take releases through the balance of the year, it solved their pipeline stalling problem for them and they became really um, great to work with. Uh, That's interesting. And the build to rent continues to be a formidable platform across the nation. Um, You know, James, with with leasing software, um, really just such a huge component for the single family rental marketplace across the nation. Uh, I'm quite sure that some of the build to rent larger aggregators out there are, you know, putting together your software as the backbone of their operations. Maybe some commentary on what you're seeing, James. Yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, you know, regardless of build to rent or or through the other channels, obviously the the need to continue to lease is is there. Uh, the those folks who are in build to rent feel that pressure 
quite a bit more because they've got a lot more cash in in the deal than maybe some other folks do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, being able to to streamline that leasing process um, and really accelerate it so you reduce your days vacant and therefore reduce rent loss due to vacancy is critical. Um, and in particular with the, those builders, but other folks as well, um, you know, really trying to help manage access to those properties uh, without having that face-to-face -face interaction when it's not uh, when it's not available to you. And so, using tools like Tenant Turner, having the electronic lock boxes, being able to get uh, builders, cleaners, vendors, handymen, drywall folks, whoever it might be into the property is just as critical to, in the build to rent world as you know finding a, a good quality prospective tenant and giving them access to the rentals. So we're seeing a lot of that too, where people are coming to Tenant Turner and saying, hey, I've got this home. We want to get these finishers in there to be able to knock out the rest of this project and do it quickly. We don't want them coming to our office to get keys. So they put them in our lock boxes. They are able to grant access through the software, track when somebody arrives, call them if they need to, to have a discussion about that project and help accelerate not just the leasing process, but before the property can even be put on market in order to get those vendors in the door and have that project completed as quickly as possible. Uh, thanks so much, James. Hey, Jeff. Um, yes, go right ahead. Hey, Jeff. Um, back to inventory, I think um, as we see the build for rent becoming more popular with the building industry, that certainly addresses and can be a great solution to inventory in the SFR investment space. I know that uh, as we've worked with builders over the last three or four years, collectively the, the publics, the nationals, the regionals, to actually assist them to create and develop a built for rent program and then where to push it out into the various MSAs and submarkets. It's interesting because we really believe at SFR Hub <clears throat> that 2020 is really going to be year one uh, for built to rent with or without COVID-19 uh, in that it's the um, purpose design build for rent communities from day one uh, we believe will be in the hundreds and uh, hundreds of communities and thousands of homes uh, over the course between now and the end of the year. Right now, we're tracking about 250 uh, purpose-built, built-to-rent, um, BFR, built-to-rent uh, subdivisions across the U.S., and that'll certainly grow between now and end of year. Uh, and then on the other end, capitalization-wise, we've seen uh, right now, we have relationships with about $25 billion of capital that's capitalized just for built for rent acquisition in the course of 2020, 2021. Those are all commercial real estate investors uh, have been typically that are coming into this built for rent space in a big way. So it, it's going to get real exciting real quick. Now, very well said. Uh, coming up on the top of the hour, I would like to get to at least one question here, and Darren, I'm going to throw it to you because th this particular question, I think, has a tr really a tremendous amount of impact on certainly where we are today, but more importantly, where we're going to be. So, um, will the forbearance program part of the CARES Act prevent live auction inventory from coming back? That is the direct question from uh, an audience member. But um, once you've answered that, I'd like you to sort of think about how the forbearance program, when it's wrapped up and those forbearances run their course, how will that affect the inventory coming into the marketplace? Darren, yeah. take it away. Great. I mean, and great segue to what Jeff said, I think, too, is one thing I, want, I, I think build to rent should be thinking about and is, you know, you've talked about 2021 as the first uh, first year or, or, or however you, you describe it there. You know, we see sometime in 2021, most likely it's, everything is moving right now. It's a moving target, but that's when a lot of that backlogged inventory that we're seeing happening right now in terms of foreclosures is going to likely hit as the forbearance programs uh, end. And, you know, we also have on top of the forbearance, we have a foreclosure moratorium, which has pretty much dried up in-person foreclosure sales to, to that, the, the question's point. I mean, we were doing about 1,500 
bringing about 1,500 properties to auction per week nationwide, and we're, we account for a little over 50% of all foreclosure auctions nationwide. And those have pretty much dried up to less less than 100 a week. And so you have even you know even without the forbearance that with that moratorium, you have a backlog of inventory building up. And the longer that moratorium goes, it's now been extended through June 30th. The more backlog inventory you have, and you know, if if we repeat, I don't necessarily think we will, but if we repeat the some of the mistakes I see from the last recession, it's allowing that, uh, allowing some of that to build up, and then keeping them per, perpetuating. The, perpetuating the pain of the the crisis longer by by doing so um and then on the on top of that then you have the forbearance which now we're up to uh, well over four million homeowners who are in forbearance if you see that uh you know really depending on how how entrenched this recession that we're in is um how many what percentage of those four million will end up in foreclosure, that is another, you know, you know, another wave of potential inventory that could be competing with build for rent or uh, at least inventory out there just in the market. And so that's, you know, in the hurricanes, which is not uh, com comparable to what we're seeing now, only 1% of the forbearance went to foreclosure sale. So if you take that 4.4 million <laughs> properties, that's not uh, that's that's not a lot of inventory, but I think we're going to see more than one percent in this situation go to go to foreclosure sale. Well, I guess at this point um, we certainly uh, put our thinking caps on and, and start to think about how that looks. But for the meantime, uh, coming out of the panel today, uh, inventory is short and uh, transactions appear to be uh, rebounding and. With that, I have to I have to call it at the top of the hour here. But uh, just a huge thank you to to really an outstanding panel. Uh, you know, I I mentioned that the past few weeks have been great, but you know today we really hit out of the park with with some of the top experts in the in the field. And a big thank you to James, Jeff, Greg, Darren, and Rosario, uh, and all your your respective insight. Uh, thank you so much once again. Uh, Suzanne and Robert from REI Inc. Uh, providing a service to the nationwide investment community uh, in this time of crisis. Uh, really well done. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Tesh. Looking forward to seeing you again next week uh, where we will be discussing funding strategies for the investment community across the United States. Thanks so much. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.